everyone, my name is Jenna, but you guys can call me Jen and welcome back to my channel. Welcome to my March reading wrap up. I'm so excited to talk about the books that I read this month. It is officially March 31st and I might possibly have another book being finished tonight. We shall see but I'll get there when I get there. So in the month of March, let's just dive in. How many books did I read? So far I have read 12 books. No, that is a lie. 13. I just haven't filled this out properly. I've read 13 books this month so far, which is pretty, pretty great. We've had a wide array of fantastic books. My least favorite book that I read this month was still three stars, which is fantastic. We love to see it. I read a range of genres this month. I read YA fantasy, adult fantasy, adult sci-fi, regular fiction, classics, even, and then a YA fiction novel as well. Otherwise, it's been a good month. So let's dive in. First and foremost, I read We Ride Upon Sticks by Quan Berry. This was my book club pick for this month for my book club with my friends, and it went over very, very well. <laughs> All of us pretty much loved it, so I'm, I'm happy with that. And it was great conversation, and it was really interesting to discuss the narrative style in this and the implications of this, of this text. I ended up giving this four stars. Really enjoyed this. It has such an interesting narrative style. So this follows a high school girls field hockey team in their senior year when they decide to dabble in some darker powers to try and win. That's basically it. it this book does such a fabulous job in, in just portraying teenagehood and the 80s. <laughs> It does it so well. Some of the conversations in here are just so pointless, but as I was sitting there reading, I was just like, this is exactly, exactly what it's like to be a teenage girl. Oh my God. And it's like the, just the spinning pointless conversations that you have and how things kind of devolve and fall apart and the worries that you have as a teenager mixed in with this darker underlying decision that they've made and the collective we narrative style. Very, very cool. I really enjoyed this. Um, if you want something that's definitely a little bit weird and and a little bit hard to wrap your head around it sometimes, but just overall really, really fun. Pick this one up. Then I ended up picking up one of my pre-orders that I got in this month. I like got it and read it almost immediately, which is very rare for me to do. I ended up picking up The Justice of Kings by Richard Swan. So I originally heard about this through Holly from Holly Hearts Books on her channel and her, you know, Goodreads and everything. And I'm now friends with her, which is like, just the greatest. I love it. I love you so much, Holly. Uh, this book was just incredible. I believe she compared it in passing to The Witcher at one point. I believe it was on Goodreads that I saw it just in passing that she was freaking out about it when she was reading it and compared it to The Witcher and I'm like 1000% I'm on that. So I pre-ordered it and picked it up and holy bananas. <laughs> that is the only way I can describe this. I literally wrote in my bullet journal, holy bananas <laughs> underneath it because that is the only way I can describe this. This was so good. I started it and at first, like first hundred pages, I was not really, you know, gripped. I wasn't really super into it. I was going, hmm, maybe I won't like this very much because I found our narrator very passive. It took me multiple chapters to even realize that we were in first person narration and we had a narrator at all. I thought it was third person because we were focused so fully on the justice in here and in his life. But I came to really, really enjoy our, our narrator and her story as well because it's such an interesting way to really paint a book. So this follows Von Volt, the justice, and Helena, his apprentice, and our, our narrator is Helena. And it follows them as they, them and like, the justice is like other helper person. He's like the muscle, I guess, the bodyguard essentially, as they're kind of going around the empire, around the realm. The justice is meeting out justice <laughs> in the name of the emperor. And at the beginning of this, they are in a slightly smaller town. They haven't been back to the capital in about two years. They've been going around and Helena has been training essentially to become a justice. But when they're in the small town, they stumble upon a murder, the murder of a high lady. And hi lady, I say that because I don't remember her title, but a lady of standing in the community. They are then tasked with finding out what happened to her and they get 
looped into this mystery. This wasn't really what I was expecting because having heard it compared to The Witcher, I was expecting it to be more of a like traditional fantasy world with like monsters and like medieval layers of stuff, but this was actually quite urban. We had lots of like cities and counselors and politics. It felt a little bit more like the cities and like kingdoms and, and intricate political things that you would see in something like Lord of the Rings. Like, you know, those like the cities that they go to in Lord of the Rings along their way. It felt a little bit more like that level of fantasy in there. So it still has the high fantasy feel, but it was like, it. I don't know, it just felt more urban to me, which I wasn't expecting. And then we had some of the most brutal fight scenes I have ever come across in my entire friggin' life. Like, it's just, there's a battle at the end of this and there's an image of a lady, not spoilery at all. There's just an image of a woman who's had her face half sheared off by a blade and she's just walking around senseless to the just horror around her. And I just, I, that image has stuck with me until this day <laughs> and uh, it will stick with me forever. There are some images in these brutal fantasy books, I can think of one from Shadow of the Gods from when I read it in December, that have just stuck with me because they are so visceral and so well done and it's just this moment of like, oh my god, and it just sticks with you. That is what this book has done and I just, it was so good. I ended up giving this one four and a half stars, if I haven't said that already. It was just so, so good and the question of morality and what exactly falls into the law and whether these people of really high standing, like a judge or justice in this, whether they are above the law or not. Do they essentially make the law? And where is the line? <laughs> so it's very interesting and I'm so excited to see the absolute derailment of the character of Von Vault after this. Anyways, next up, I actually borrowed this book from the library but then ended up buying it from a discount store because I found it for like seven dollars. It's pretty great. But that is Seven Devils by Elizabeth May and Laura Lamb. So this is just, oh gosh, this is the year where the sci-fi books that I read are just knocking it out of the park every time I read them. So I read this going in knowing that we have some LGBTQIA plus characters and it's fun and spacey. That's literally all I went in knowing. I came out with a deep love for every single one of these characters. I really enjoyed this. I ended up giving this four stars, but like probably on reread it would be even better. And I'm so excited to read the sequel whenever I can get my hands on it because I just, I loved it so much. It is found family. It is space heist. It is people on the run. It is people who can change their face and change their name and run from who they are. It's space royalty. It is so good. <laughs> And I, I just really enjoyed it. When I first picked it up, I knew immediately, like first first few pages, first few chapters, I was like, I'm in 1000%. This is just so fantastic. We follow mainly our characters, Eris and Chloe. They're the ones that start the book. So I would say that they're probably our main characters, but then we end up meeting a bunch of other people. So we get mostly their backstories and stuff because in this it's formatted in a way where you get like present day narratives and then in their past narrative. So at the beginning of this, I didn't really love how much backstory we were getting in moments. I was like, I just want the story now. But by the time I finished it, I was like, you know what? No, we needed those backstory moments because we needed to know who these people were and where they like got to in the moment of this. All right, so we also follow Nyx, <laughs> this awesome, you know, just absolutely badass woman. And we follow Ariadne and Rhea. So those three as well come into this and they all end up being part of this, you know, family. I loved this. I loved the mission that they were on. I loved how intricate it got. I loved the different points of view we got from each of these characters and how different they felt. Because I find sometimes with lots of points of view, you can get very similar feeling points of view and then you're kind of sitting there and you really don't remember who's speaking. I also picked up the audiobook for this and it's only voiced by one woman. So I was sitting there going, oh, this is gonna be interesting because one person narrating a multi POV book, sometimes it's hard to tell the difference on who they're talking like through, whose point of view they're in. But no, no, it was fine. It was so easy to tell them all apart. I really wanna read the sequel if you couldn't tell how much I loved this. But yes, Seven Devils. It's so good, read it. <laughs> then I ended up picking up an arc of Blood Scion, which I've been trying to make my way through for a while, but I ended up 
picking it up once it had released. So this is already out in the world and you guys should definitely go pick it up because this was very good. I ended up listening to the audiobook for this as well, which is also really, really, really good. And it just, you know, helped me get through it because I have issues reading books normally now. Uh, but this was great. I ended up giving this one four stars. This is so dark. Look up all the trigger warnings, please, before you go in this because it is brutal. We are dealing with child soldiers here. So it is brutal. Please look up the trigger warnings if you are at all wanting to read this because you need to be prepared going into this. It's one of those books that I needed to read something very light afterwards. This follows our main character Sloane who at the beginning of this is, I want to say like a mage in hiding. I don't believe that's what they call no, they call them scions. What am I talking about? A scion in hiding. And scions in this world are people with magical powers. They're essentially like the descendants of gods. In a way, they're like the bloodline of a god. But in this world, it is a very in the middle of being colonized kind of a world where the people who are like oppressing the locals are also killing the people with magic because the people with magic are bad. Sloan is a scion in hiding. And she turns 15, and in this world, when you turn 15, you have the possibility of being drafted. Most definitely, you're going to be drafted into the war. And so she's drafted, and she has to essentially hide who she is all the way through. And she becomes a child soldier and goes through these trials and sees so many people murdered and just is broken again and again and again and again. And by the time I got to the end of this book, I was sitting there and there's a moment at the end where I was screaming at my book that if something happened, I would not be able to finish the book. That's how bad it was. I was just like, if this happens, I'm throwing this book against the wall and I'm not I'm not gonna no we're just gonna that would be like the last straw that would actually kill our main character that would actually physically break her into pieces yeah this book is very dark so if you plan on going into it again check trigger warnings but it is also very good and I think you should read it 100% next up as I said I needed a little bit of an upturn in tone I was pick I picked up Master of Jen by P. Jelly Clark I've been listening to this the same week that I was reading that as well as like a you know a tone differentiator this is just this is P. Jelly Clark's third work inside this world, but it is his first novel. I also ended up reading later in the month his novella, one of his novellas in this world. It's like right before this one. You don't need to read them in order to understand what's going on in the book, but it is the novella that like goes before this and then there's another novella before this. The novella follows different people and I will talk about it later when I get to it, but this follows Agent Fatima of the Magical Society of something. There's a whole title. There's a whole title. She is the youngest woman working for the Ministry of Alchemy, Enchantments, and Supernatural Entities. And she's awesome. She's so cool. She like breaks gender roles and stuff and like shows up to work in the most flamboyant suits because she just can. This is set in 1912 Cairo, a magical steampunk Cairo. It is very, very cool. There's like animals that are just made out of robotics. And then there's also like gin who just live amongst the people. So it's magical and just, it's just, it's such a cool world. And I love this world so much. I love being in it. This starts off with a murder of a whole ass cult. <laughs> and it follows Fatima as she uh, unravels what happens in it. I ended up giving this four stars because it was, it got a little bit too cheesy for me at the end, but I really liked how um, it like all wrapped up and it was a nice, you know, mirroring a beginning and end kind of a thing. I really liked the aspect of like deals and making deals with Jin that came back around in this. And I really liked the characters, Fatima and CT, just amazing. And the other agents were so good. This is just so much fun. And I really, really enjoyed this. Next up, I picked up another book from my library, which is The Bone Houses by Emily Lloyd Jones. And this is my only five star of the month. I, I read this in one sitting in like three hours. It was just fabulous. It is a YA fantasy that has the flavor of Among the Beasts and Briars by Ashley Poston. It, it, it is a very, very, very similar story to this, but this one leans more fairy tale. That one leans more, it, it, it also has a fairy tale vibe, but like a more mature fairy tale vibe than I would give the uh, Beasts and Briars one. This was just exceptional. So it follows our main characters, uh, just the sweetest beans, Rin, and Ellis, and both of them are just the sweetest, softest beans. 
I love this so much. So Rin is the daughter of a gravedigger who has essentially taken up her father's job because he went missing and her uncle's also gone missing and they are about, her and her two siblings are about to be evicted from their house essentially because their uncle had debts and their father also had a, something going on, like some sort of debt and like the guy who runs the town is just awful and is like about to evict these three children from their house. Rin is the one who protects her house and her family and her village from these entities called bone houses. And bone houses are these, they're zombies, all right? <laughs> they're like Victorian level zombies. Dead bodies who have been reanimated through the magic of the ground of this place. But most people in the village don't believe that they even exist because they have never seen them. They are elements of like myth and legend and stories and they don't believe that they exist. Rin keeps them at bay <laughs> because she goes out at night with her ax and just yeets them away. She just chops them up into pieces and and then brings him back into the into the town to burn. And then we have another main character named Ellis. He's a map maker that comes to the city. He also has a chronic disability, a chronic illness, I believe. It's not exactly specified, but it is an old, old, old injury in his shoulder that flares up and gives him incredible pain, sometimes so debilitating that he literally cannot wake up for days. So he comes in and him and her essentially are like, we're gonna fix this. We're gonna see why these bone houses are suddenly able to cross the threshold from the forest and actually come into the town and some of them are actually attacking people and so they go on this adventure that is just so wonderful and <laughs> I just I love this book so much the descriptions of the landscape that they go through and when and then they eventually reach a castle at some point and it's abandoned but just the descriptions of it it is just lush and it is like bathed in fairy tale and folk tale nature but it is so dark as well because we're dealing with people who deal with grief on the daily and these bone houses who are essentially reanimated corpses and they're if whether or not they are actually dangerous and it's just it was so very good which is why i gave it five stars next we have uh another library book i read before the coffee gets cold by toshikazu kawaguchi this one i only gave three stars to it was almost a dnf for me because the first like first story that i read in it because it's like a four four short stories that make up a, a narrative kind of a thing and the first story just didn't interest me at all i was really bored and I was pretty bored throughout the entire thing, but it, by the end it did get me a little and it was very easy to read. I read it in like two hours kind of a thing, not even. It was fine. It's It follows a coffee shop that you can travel back in time to. There's there's rules and there's all this, all this stipulation and stuff that like nothing will actually change, but you can go back in time to see something if you so desire. It's an interesting concept. I just didn't really love it very much. Then I read... One for All by Lily Lineoff, which is a gender-bent Three Musketeers retelling that has a main character with a disability, which is Potts. This book was just fantastic. I gave this four and a half stars. It was so, so, so good. <sighs> Very good. It, historical fiction. The fan family in this was epic. This was a month of like fan family. This and Seven Devils, just incredible. I just, I loved this so much. So it follows Tanya, who at the beginning of this story loses her father in a very brutal way, and she decides to set out and uh, exact revenge on who killed her father. But she is then sent to a finishing school, which turns out to be an actually a fencing school to prepare young girls to become musketeers. And so she joins this school and she meets the three other girls there who are just the best, and the four of them create just this wonderful family together, and it just <gasps> heartwarming and the adventure was wonderful. Fabulous historical YA book. Just really, really, really good. It ran out of storage, so I had to clear some stuff off my camera, but okay, we're back. We're ready to go. We are back. Next up, I realized I said at the beginning of this video that I had only one, or not beginning of this video, when I was talking about the bone houses that that was my only five star. I lied. This was also a five star because it's Pride and Prejudice. <laughs> It is just so good. It, it was a reread, fourth time through. I've been on a Jane Austen kick recently because I've been watching a podcast called Pod and Prejudice that I just absolutely love. Did I say watching? I meant listening to a podcast that I just really, really love. It's got me on a Jane Austen kick, so I decided to reread Pride and Prejudice, which was just so fantastic. And of course it's five stars because I love this book so much. You guys know Pride and Prejudice, Elizabeth, Dar Elizabeth and Darcy. You know the story of Pride and Prejudice. I don't need to give you a recap of that. 
But yeah, I also read that this month. Then I read another exceptional fantasy book, and that is Scorpica by G. R. McAllister. This was just so good. <laughs> I ended up giving this one four and a half stars. I just really fell in love with this. So this is a book that follows a period of I think of like 10 to 15 years through this queendom. And the queendom, I believe, has an actual name. Let me grab it. Does it not have an actual name? Oh, I'm pretty sure it does. Uh, it doesn't say though. Hmm. But it follows this queendom and we have Scorpica and Paxim and Cestia and Arca and then the Bastion and all of the stuff in between. It follows this, the, the queendom as it goes through essentially what is the drought of girls. So in this world, women rule all. They are the be all and end all. It's sort of at the beginning of this, we have the drought of girls, which means that no girls are being born. And it's it's just like the catalyst of all these events in here. We follow many different points of view in this. We follow an ancient sorceress back from the dead. We follow uh, the Scorpic which are warriors, like Spartan-esque warriors. We follow a mom and a daughter from Arca, who both have magic. We follow a band of thieves, and we also follow a queen and her daughter as well. <laughs> But just the mapping of this world over these years and the events that happen in it is just so wonderful. And I do have to say that I feel like this book could be a new favorite of mine. This whole series, once it comes out, is going to be a new favorite of mine. I can feel it. The way that this sets up the world and all of these people into motion, we have some unfinished storylines, some unfinished threads, which I really, really hope come back in the next few books because I'm just, <laughs> there's so many characters in this that I want the best for and they're just so wonderful. It's just so wonderful and the pacing of this is very, very good. But with each of the storylines, you don't really know like what kind of the point of this is. It's mostly a revolving around the catalyst of being in the drought of girls. It just follows these people as their lives are going through that. And it's just, it's very interesting, it's not slice of life. It's almost, it's, I would call it almost an epic because of the way that it spans all these years and all these moments in these women's and girls' lives. <sighs> It was just, it was very good and I really recommend it like so much. I will say there's a lot of sex in this. So it is definitely 18 plus, but the sex isn't like Sarah J Mass kind of sex. You know what I mean? This is like just part of life. Some of it is fade to black, some of it is not. It's just there as a moment. Like it's not like there's not really any romantic plot lines in this, but the sex that's in here is just mainly for, you know, a fact of life. It's for the pleasure of these women. It's just there, which I really liked that. Like I was shocked when I first started to read it that how much it was like from page one, very clear about how much sex and pleasure had a point in these women's lives, but it wasn't the point of the book. I, this was just very good. <laughs> if you couldn't tell how much I love this, so many of these books that I read this month absolutely just knocked it out of the park. I'm gonna put this down and stop talking about it because it's just that fantastic. But the next book that I read was The Haunting of Tramcar 015, which is the book that I was talking about earlier with The Master of Jin. This is the second book in that world. This is the second novella as well. This follows two different agents though. It doesn't follow Agent Fatma. It follows Agent Hamed and Agent Onsi as they discover the haunting of Tramcar 015. And that's all I'm gonna give you because it's a novella. It's very good and I really enjoyed where it went. P. Jelly Clark just has a way of giving us such wonderful little concise stories and paints us such beautiful, beautiful characters. Like, so good, so good. Then I ended up picking up the novella The Ballad of Black Tom by Victor Lavalli or Laval. Don't know how to say his last name, but whew, this was something. This was something. Oh, by the way, also gave this one four stars. But I gave The Ballad of Black Tom as well four stars. It was so interesting to me. It definitely has H.G. Wells' Call of Cthulhu guy. <laughs> And I call myself an English major. I think that's him. It has his influence because this, I believe, is a retelling of one of Wells' stories, not Call of Cthulhu, but like in the vein of his horror stories. Because this was horrifying. And not only because of like the monstrous element of this, but because of the just regular people in it. So this, I will warn you, has I trigger warnings for police brutality and racism. 
incredible, just ev like just everywhere in it because it follows sent like two characters kind of it follows Tom this guy at the beginning who is just a black guy trying to make ends meet and trying to live a dr uh, his life in Harlem at the at the time that this is written I want to say this is like the 20s or something I'm not entirely sure when this was written but he he lives in Harlem he also does deals for people and works with a magic shop sort of to like get artifacts to people for like he runs little jobs he also lives with his father as well and it also follows one of the police people as well near the latter half of the book as things start to change. That's all I'll give you <laughs> because it's a lot and I went in blind. I was just like okay hey, cool this is like I know this is has like a dash of horror might even have a dash of, of fantasy. I went in blind and I was so glad that I did. I listened to this on audio and it was just wild. <laughs> It's the last one that I finished last night, which I didn't expect to finish last night. And it is my friend's book club pick for this month. And I still don't know how to feel about this book. I have a vlog coming out for this one. So watch out for that with all my ranting, raving, losing my mind at midnight thoughts last night. I ended up reading this to about page 340 something and going, okay, I need to put this down because it's actually melting my brain. And I, I, won't be able to sleep properly if I don't put it down. Within 10 minutes, I had it back in my hand and I finished it because I couldn't stop thinking about it. That is House of Leaves by Mark Z. Danielewski. Now, this is not, I wouldn't say this is a good book. <laughs> I ended up giving this one three and a half stars after running it through cop pile and all the things. Three and a half stars. So much of this to me is just absolutely pointless. It is hard to read for no reason. But when I try to reason with myself and say like, what if we just got like the story of the house in this? What kind of a f story would that be without all the elements around it? So, if you guys don't know, House of Leaves is a visual goddamn experience and I would not recommend this to anybody unless you want to torture yourself. So the story starts out with this guy named Johnny who finds um, the dead body with his friend who finds the dead body of this man named Zampano. Zampano in his apartment has a like case that Johnny finds and opens it up and realizes that it is like a book, a manuscript essentially with all of this ephemera around it. And Johnny takes this work, which is Zampano's like life work kind of, and he starts combing through it. It's like framed as such. We have Johnny's like introduction forward situation to this book at the beginning. And then we have the Navidson record, which is what Zampano wrote. And the Navidson record is the main part of the story that has footnotes from Zampano as well. And then it also has footnotes from Johnny. And Johnny goes off on tangents for pages and pages and pages about his own life in these footnotes. And then there's also footnotes on the footnotes, occasionally, where Johnny has to explain something. Or we have a third point of view, the editor who's put this book together has to explain something. So it is the story in its essentials of Johnny reading through the Navidson record, which is written by Zampano, who was also incredibly biased in his writing of it. So you can really feel Zampano's like touch in this story. But it is also the story of the Navidson record, which is a analysis <laughs> of a found footage style film of this wacky house <laughs> that is spooky as hell and these people who live there and this is wild. This is truly a wild read and it is like nothing else I've read ever. I feel like having read this, I've been totally changed. How? I don't know. Maybe it's just because my brain really hurts from being up to like two in the morning because I literally couldn't shut my brain off after reading this. It was a bad idea for me to read this all in one sitting basically so. And Anyways, my guys, those are all the books that I read so far in March. This is a very long video because I have just been rambling, so I do apologize. But please let me know down below if you stuck through to the end, to the weirdness of House of Leaves. And because of that, leave me a little comment down below with a leaf emoji for House of Leaves. And let me know if you've read any of these books or now plan to because I've talked about them. Have I intrigued you as to my reads? Either way, my friends, <laughs> thank you so much for watching. Make sure to like and subscribe to stick around and hear my thoughts about House of Leaves in the upcoming reading vlog that will be up eventually. Other than that, I'll catch you in another video very soon. Stay kind and keep on reading.